Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, I, um, I'm here at UCSD in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and my re I am a synthetic organometallic chemist. And what organometallic chemistry is in brief is the manipulation of the transition elements, it's those sort of scary elements in the middle of the periodic table with organic matter. Um, and also the alternative, it's the manipulation of organic matter with, by the transition elements as well. And organometallic chemistry now is a pretty mature field. It's responsible for all of the polyethylene and polypropylene that goes into our beautiful plastic bags and plastic bottles that we like to throw in the trash. Um, in addition, a lot of the soles of your shoes, the rubbers that are uh, a component of that, are made by organometallic catalysts. In addition, I would say you're hard pressed now to find any pharmaceutical compound that we take as medicines that hasn't um, been synthesized using an organometallic chemistry step. However, in the beginning of organometallic chemistry, it was really um, a curiosity, I would say. And what I have here is an illustration of some of the fundamental molecules in organometallic chemistry. These are very simple molecules where you have transition metal centers just surrounded by carbon monoxide ligands. The gray is carbon, the, uh, the red is oxygen there. And what these particular molecules represent, I'm sure everybody in the room has heard of free radicals. These are supercharged free radicals. These are molecules that have an electronic structure that are missing several electrons. And in chemistry, we call that the height of reactivity, electron deficiency. And why these molecules were so interesting um, in the early days, they were studied by really physical chemists, I would say, in the gas phase and in cryogenic matrices, and also considered theoretically by some of the real luminaries in uh, computational and theoretical chemistry, like the Nobel laureate Roald Hoffman, was really to answer simple questions about the fundamental nature of bonding between transition metals and their ligands. And so these molecules here, I like to refer to as the ghost molecules. These are molecules that cannot be isolated. They are often catalytic intermediates or molecules with exceedingly short lifetimes, usually on the order of a microsecond or, or uh, less. And needless to say, these are molecules that when you learn about organometallic chemistry in the classroom, sort of in upper division in organic chemistry or in the graduate class, you study these molecules to really understand the behavior and some, in some respect the possibilities of what transition metals can do. And I, when I took these classes, I was always very enamored by this story because an entire field in terms of its fundamental nature is basically built around molecules that can't be isolated. These are molecules, again, that you see at 4 Kelvin, 5 Kelvin, or in the gas phase. But if you look at them and start to understand these beautiful electronic structures, you would say these would be molecules that could really do some really interesting chemistry if you could figure out a way to isolate them in the condensed phase. And so when, we, when I, my group started here at UCSD in 2007, we basically had this simple idea. How do we take these ghosts and turn them into real things? How do we take molecules that can't be isolated in normal conditions like we have now and make at least mimics or models of them or like what I like to call molecules that embody the spirit of these reactive entities such that we can do some productive chemistry? And so when we started, what we did is a relatively simple idea, which is we looked at these metal carbonyl complexes that are highly reactive, and we just used a little bit of electronic analogy between carbon monoxide and an organic compound called anisocyanide. And we thought that uh, the uh, carbon monoxide is a particular electronic structure. Isocyanides have a similar electronic structure, but the isocyanides can actually have these big organic groups where we can then build in steric protection for these molecules and at least have a chance of isolating compounds that look like these ghosts. And so over the years, we've made a whole series of these organic groups to stabilize these compounds. And what I like to say on this slide is my trophy case. These are a bunch of molecules that we've made that, that basically mimic these ghost molecules. What this slide represents is the X-ray crystal structure of these compounds. And so that means that these compounds have been isolated as solid materials at room temperature that we were able to determine their precise electronic structures. And what we've done over many years is we've under, uh, synthesized these compounds, we've studied their behavior, and sometimes we've just marveled at their beauty. And now you may be thinking, this sounds like a pretty esoteric science that has very little application to the real world. And what I'm here to tell you is that you're absolutely right. 
100%. <laughs> and this is where Research Corporation and foundational support have come in. Research Corporation um, really made a very early investment in my research program because what I think um, uh, I like to say is I was really trying to pull at the heartstrings of organometallic chemistry. These were compounds that have been studied theoretically um, uh, for many, many years by such luminaries, but it's really remarkable that a science that is so mature, right, is based on compounds that you really can't touch and feel. And so when we endeavored to try to make these compounds, and what I, what I like to say to put a face to the name, Research Corporation was really there to uh, support us and believe in this type of research that hopefully it could come up with or we could develop some really interesting things that at least even challenged some of the fundamentals of organometallic chemistry and then bring it into sort of a new era. And so what this uh, uh, slide shows here is actually my uh, Cottrell Scholar application, amazingly, from 2010, so about 10 years ago. And I just I just want to point out this little uh, uh, section here where we said we have recently found that the isocyanometallate, uh, which iron with four of the ligands, whatever, the rest is jargon, uh, is available in low yield upon whatever. This is encouraging and we intend to optimize the synthesis. And so this was really a very, very early, early uh, inkling that we had some interesting results um, in this area making iron isocyanide compounds. And so over the years, we've really been exploring this particular area. And what I can say is that this was the compound that we first uh, were talking about in that application. Iron with four of these ligands, it's got a di-anionic charge. Um, and we've studied this particular molecule. We were able to optimize it in much higher yield to study its behavior and figure out what we can do with it. And over the years, we saw that it is quite reactive. It does some really remarkable things. But like anything, it has some limitations. And so uh, in, uh, uh, as we went on in this particular area, we developed some other molecules. Here's iron with two of the ligands with two dinitrogen ligands. And so the chemists in the audience will realize this is not a very stable compound. This is a compound that's quite beautiful in terms of its actual um, composition and electronic structure, but possibly not so useful because it's just a little bit too reactive. And that allowed us to really target this compound in the middle, which is really the sweet spot. It has two of our sort of signature ligands and two carbon monoxide ligands. And what this particular uh, uh, arrangement does is tone down the reactivity enough so that we can actually see some other unique things by using the steric protection that's offered by these organic groups. And so this was sort of an idea that started about 10 years ago. We've continued to work on it. And really what's come to fruition in the past uh, few years is really a very important discovery for our group that, again, goes to the very foundation of organometallic and inorganic chemistry, where we were able to use this particular iron compound to make this compound here, which was the first example of a terminally coordinated boron monofluoride. And so now I'm taking you down the rabbit hole even more. But why this is important is that everybody in the audience, I'm sure, is uh, very familiar with these small molecules here, like carbon monoxide, dinitrogen makes up 80% of our atmosphere atmosphere, the cyanide ion, if you're not familiar with that, you should be to definitely stay away from it, and in some respect, nitrosonium. What's important about these molecules is that they are all 10 electron diatomic molecules, very, very simple compounds that we learn in general chemistry, even at the high school level. Boron monofluoride is also a 10 electron species where it's three from boron and uh, seven from fluorine, except boron monofluoride is not a compound that you normally uh, interact with on a daily basis. In fact, Boron monofluoride is an incredibly reactive species. And so where I told you some of the molecules that we try to uh, go after are these compounds that you can only isolate in the uh, condensed phase or in the gas phase or in cryogenic conditions, here's the opposite extreme. These are, this is a molecule that you can only really generate at 2,000 degrees Celsius. And this is a compound that's been known to physical chemists for many years. Um, it is highly reactive. The reason that it is so highly reactive and so much different than carbon carbon monoxide or dinitrogen is because of its electronic structure, uh, where uh, dinitrogen has what we like to call a very large homolumo gap that defines its electronic structure. Carbon monoxide has a smaller gap where it is stable under ambient conditions, but more reactive than dinitrogen. And then that gap closes quite substantially when you go to boron monofluoride. And so this is the reason that you cannot isolate this compound. Um, however, it's always been a curiosity in inorganic chemistry. We also learn about B 
PDF in our upper division inorganic chemistry and graduate classes as a what if type molecule. What if you can make this? This would be like a supercharged carbon monoxide, except again, unattainable, except now it's attainable. And what's really wonderful about this particular compound um, is the fact that uh, uh, Nobel laureate Roald Hoffman and several other peoples have tried to understand this molecule theoretically. Again, a what if type science. And one of the theoretical constructs that uh, people have considered quite substantially is a compound that has four carbon monoxide ligands, iron, and then the BF molecule. And what's really nice about the compound that we've made is that is exactly an analog or a model of this theoretical construct. So again, it's taking these compounds that are really curiosities, that people just are using their imagination to say, what if we have them, and really giving the exact type of compound that we can then play with. In addition, we can use our synthetic talents to uh, make compounds that are just like this. So here's that BF compound here. We've also very uh, been able to prepare the corresponding dinitrogen compound and the carbon monoxide compound. So now you can compare these 10 electron diatomics on the exact same transition metal platform. And you don't have to be an expert to see these plots here, where you can see dinitrogen has this sort of solid lines here, which is very symmetrical. And when you go to carbon monoxide, it skews a little bit because of polarity, you can look at the BF here and say that looks a lot different than these two. And when you have something new and unique, uh, you also probably have something special. And so we've been really excited to understand this molecule, at least show it to the community and say, here it is. And, and actually, it's pretty amazing because it's one of these things that when my uh, student first found this compound, I said, no way. First of all, I'm like, that's got to be known because people have been after this thing for a long time. Turns out it wasn't. And then my next thought is, I can't believe I'm the person who actually got this. People have been looking for this for decades, and we were able to achieve that really with the seed money starting uh, from Research Corporation. Um, and so once you have something that's unique, you can go a little further. I always say to my students, really the only limitation is your imagination, not necessarily uh, your molecules. Your molecules will do all kinds of things. How uh, far can you uh, move your mind? And so we've been able to take this boron monofluoride compound and treat it with a particular reagent to now make a BO compound. And what's important about this is this is also another 10 electron diatomic isoelectronic to cyanide, if you will. And so all of a sudden, where we've been familiar for the past 200 years of chemistry with dinitrogen and carbon monoxide and the cyanide ion as 10 electron diatomics. In the past two years, we've been able to add two more of those, BF and BO minus, um, as entities that are possibly uh, able to uh, do some interesting chemistry and also guide the reactivity of transition metal complexes. And so the first carbon monoxide complex of a transition metal was found about 120 years ago. So I'm thinking in about 120 years, right, that maybe people using BF will be quite routine and not a uh, curiosity and not something that's uh, really outrageous or surprising. And if that's the case, you heard it here first. And so that's what I want to leave you with. And so just to uh, wrap up, um, I want to just thank the person who did all that beautiful chemistry. This is uh, Miles Drance, one of my students. He's going to defend his thesis in a month. He's done an absolutely terrific job. I also want to give a little plug to our x-ray crystallography facility here at UCSD. It's probably the world's best with nine diffractometers and just an incredible facility built by Arnie Reingold and Curtis Moore and Milan Jambicki, and we have would be nowhere without them, without the ability to actually see our compounds. And I also want to express my true and sincere gratitude to Research Corporation, really for that early investment in our work, for believing in the type of chemistry that we were doing, um, especially in organometallic chemistry, which is a mature field. Um, we were trying to do things that I think were a little bit different and really uh, believed in our program and has supported us for uh, the past 10 years. In addition to Research Corporation, um, I've been very fortunate with uh, being able to uh, convince other foundations to invest in us as well, uh, specifically the uh, Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation with a new faculty award in 2007 and also a teacher scholar award in 2012, and Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for a fellowship in 2011, and of course the Hellman Foundation here. And this, uh, this support was really instrumental to giving us the ability or giving me the ability to recruit and retain personnel and have the resources to really explore 
chemical space to try to find some of these really interesting molecules. It's, you could probably imagine that with, uh, in, a, in a field there where there's a lot known, a lot of times you can do experiments and find something that's known. And so you have to work pretty hard and really go down the rabbit hole in terms of synthesis to go into the unknown. And this support was actually instrumental in allowing us both the person power and the financial resources to do that until finally you know, some of these other entities could pick up the slack, which uh, eventually they did, of course. Um, <laughs> And so, again, I really appreciate um, the great relationships we've had over the year, Richard, Sylvia. Um, it's been really fantastic and really instrumental to uh, my career, certainly in the very beginning. And so with that, um, thank you for having me here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So it turns out that the BF compound is incredibly reactive. And so in that particular reaction, and Sylvia, who's an uh, inorganic organometallic chemist, um, so that's just nucleophilic displacement of fluoride right, with lithium uh, trimethyl siloxide. Um, there, this particular reaction is actually quite general, where we can use where fluoride serves as a leaving group. But what that highlights is that BF, even though we, I think you saw my talk at the ACS meeting, it is strongly bound to the metal center. It is incredibly electrophilic, and so it's really an interesting source of reactivity in a way that I think is quite different than CO. CO is obviously electrophilic in certain respects, but this here, the electrophilicity is just through the roof. And so we're developing. We're right now trying to study all of the possible possible chemistry and reaction patterns that it can undergo, but we're finding some quite interesting things. To answer your question specifically, what can this do? I'm not sure yet. I'm hoping other people find out. What we're really trying to figure out is if we can move BF to other transition metal centers or other organometallic platforms where we can really use it to control the electronic structure very precisely, very tune the electronic tr structure of compounds so that they can be reactive for whatever types of applications people are interested in. And so we'll see. We're, we're, we're going to work on this for years. Let me ask that a different way. Sure. Last uh, last summer at the Cottrell Scholar Conference, Will Dictel gave a talk where he stressed that when he creates novel chemistry, he's not looking for applications. He's looking at those uh, novel uh, chemicals for their properties. And their unexpected properties sometimes lead to applications, but as you create different scaffolds for these reaction centers, do you find that the scaffolds confer interesting properties that you didn't expect? Absolutely, all the time. And so this is obviously just a brief uh, overview of some of the things that we've done, but I can answer that question in two different ways. We find unusual behavior of the, or in reactivity of these compounds constantly. That's what keeps me in business. Um, that when you make these compounds that have these unusual environments, unusual electronic structures, and then you throw in small molecules, dinitrogen, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, you name it, which have routine patterns, if you will, or traditional chemical reactivity with other organic compounds or organometallic compounds. Well, we do similar reactions. We find new activation modes, new types of chemistry all of the time all of the time. And that was sort of the original intention of the work. If you make something that's so highly reactive, so unattainable, if you're willing to do the synthetic investment to, I like to say this is the total synthesis version of organometallic chemistry, where our compounds, just to get to what's interesting, is sometimes 12 steps. If you're willing to put in that synthetic investment, you will find things that are truly amazing. Um, I believe in that very strongly, and uh, what Will said is absolutely positively correct. And we don't go into this thinking about what an application is. Um, we're not, we're unfortunately not that creative. What I say to my students all the time is, here's an area, here's a target, go and make it. And once you've made it, and once you have it, have fun, see what it can do. And that's when we, that's when the discovery starts. And so that's, that is the guiding light of our program. Thanks so much for the talk. Thank you.